Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday night, the Experienced Bible Study. I'm Pastor John Kenny, the pastor of Third Baptist Church, and I am so grateful that you've joined us on tonight as we share around the word of the Lord. We have been studying over the last several months this series entitled Discipleship. We've been looking at the call, the way, the truth, and the life. And we're in unit two right now, which is the way. And tonight we're going to be looking at lesson number four in this particular unit. So I hope and pray that you open your heart, open your mind, open your spirit to what the Lord wants to teach us on tonight. It is our sincere prayer. It is our sincere belief that God has begun something wonderful in all of us. And we are eagerly awaiting the finished product. But we understand that before we can get to the finished product, there has to be some work involved in our own lives. So with that being said, I want to welcome you tonight. If this is your first time, I hope and pray that it won't be your last time. If this is your second, third, fourth, fifth time, I'm grateful that you come back again for another time. Amen. So praise be unto God. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the promise that's in your word. We thank you for the power that we find in you. We thank you for the hope that you give us. We thank you for the love that you provide to us. And God, we ask you now in the name of Jesus the Christ, we ask you to bless us immensely on tonight, O oh Lord, and allow your name to be honored and to be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And tonight, my brothers and sisters, we're going to be looking tonight at Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. And we're going to be focusing our attention tonight on verses 1 through 15 out of Matthew chapter number 10. And I'm going to be reading tonight from the New International Version of Scripture. So I hope and pray you have your notepad. Hope and pray you have a pen. For those who are joining us tonight, on there's going to be a link that's going to have the lessons attached. So you can just download the link and you can get the downloaded presentation of the lessons tonight to have at your own leisure, to have at your own time. If you're on the website tonight and you want to get the lesson, all you have to do is scroll over to where it says, Let's Grow on our main page and the drop-down tab where it says Bible Study Lessons. Click on the very first lesson, April the 12th, Lesson 4, and you can have it right there as well for your own study. But let's begin tonight, beginning in verse 1 out of Matthew chapter number 10, where we're talking tonight about Jesus equips his disciples. The Word of God reads, beginning at verse 1 in Matthew chapter number 10, He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, greet, give it your greetings. If the home is not deserving, let your peace rest on it, if your home is deserving rather. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, 
shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home of town. I tell you the truth. It would be more tolerable or bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And tonight, I really want us to focus our attention tonight on this idea, this thought that Jesus has when he equips his disciples to go out to teach. Just so that you understand tonight, you have been equipped. You have been equipped to do the work that the Lord has called you to do. You have been equipped to be able to, be able to adequately handle the responsibility that comes with being a disciple. When you look at Matthew chapter number 10, Matthew chapter number 10 now is the turning point, if you will, in the life of the disciples. Because now they move from being students primarily to now actually being doers of the word. They move now from being just passive participants to active agents in what God had called them to do. In Matthew chapter number 10, Jesus sent them out in pairs to ministry. He sent them away from him to do the work of ministry. You and I have been called to do the work of ministry. And with the work of ministry, we have to understand that God has already equipped us to handle and to do what needs to be done. Now, I can hear you saying to yourself, preacher, I don't know all these scriptures, preacher. I don't have this gift of speech, preacher. I don't, I'm not able to muster up the strength to, or the confidence to do what God is calling me to do. But I want to encourage you tonight because first and foremost, Jesus has equipped us with several resources at our own disposal. You have talents. You have some ability. You have the church. The church's primary function is to equip the saints. Here it is, to do the work of the ministry. That the church is not just the place where you go to get yourself re-energized on Sunday. It's not the place where you go to have the latest news shared to you. It's not the place where you go to have the latest fish fry. But the church is the place where you go and you are equipped to do the work of the ministry. You gain insight. You gain knowledge. You gain confidence. You, the church is the incubator, if you will, that will allow you to be able to do what God has called you to do. That's why it's so, it's so tragic when people fail to invest themselves in the journey that God has called them on. When people fail to invest themselves in the resources that God has given them. You also have the greatest resource that could ever be given to any believer, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit. See, what makes your journey and my journey different than the disciples' journey is that the disciples, pre-resurrection, the disciples did not have the Holy Spirit. They had Jesus to come back to, to report to. They had Jesus walking alongside them. They had Jesus there physically. But you and I are not afforded that luxury. And that's not a drawback. That's really an added blessing. Because what it says is that when they were with Jesus, Jesus could not be with them every step of the way. Whenever they departed from his presence, they were really absent him. But when you understand that you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, the greatest resource God could ever give you, you realize that there's never a point in your journey where you are absent the presence, absent the power, absent the resources, absent the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So every believer, every disciple has been equipped with the church, with talents, with abilities, with the Holy Spirit, and with the Word of God. Because if you can't remember it, the Word of God is there to bring it back to your remembrance. If you can't remember it, then you have the Word of God to draw off of. Disciples, 
my brothers and sisters. Why this is so important tonight is because when you begin to really evaluate and assess how you have been gifted, how you have been anointed, how you have been given the talents that you have, how you have been given the abilities that you've been given, it is because God, here it is, God has called you to advance the kingdom of God throughout the world. That when Jesus sent these disciples out, when he sent them to towns and sent them to villages and sent them to places where they were going to be welcome and places where they were not, where they were going to be unwelcome, they were going out for one primary cause. And that was, and that still is, to advance the kingdom of God. Why you have to understand that tonight is because the kingdom of God is not going to be advanced. Here it is outside of the participation of those whom God has called into relationship. Break it down, preacher. Here it is. The kingdom of God, the message of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God cannot be advanced outside of the involvement of the disciples in their fulfillment of what God has called them to do. Jesus sends them out. He sends them out. They were unique in their own ability. They were unique in their own way. Each one of them had, each one of them had a, a, a context, if you will, that they were familiar with. One was a tax collector. There was a, there was a context. Some were fishermen. That was a context that they had. Each one had a unique background that they came out of. And it was that background that was that God was going to use to help them do what they had been called to do. Don't minimize the background. Don't minimize your context. Don't minimize where God brought you from. Don't minimize the, the surroundings that you were raised in. Don't minimize how your life has been up until this point because God wants to use all of that to help you fulfill your divine purpose in God. So Jesus equips us with the Bible. He equips us with the church. He equips us with gifts and talents because he wants us to advance the kingdom of God. Now, the only way that you and I can be are able to obey what God is called to do because you know and I know that, this, that the call to discipleship is a tough call. The call to discipleship is a tough journey. The call to be a disciple is one that requires a great deal of commitment, a great level of sacrifice, but it also requires a great deal of obedience. See, Jesus, the disciples are called that they might achieve what seems to be an incredible goal, the advancement of the kingdom of God. That, that, that goal seems far-fetched. That goal seems impossible. That goal seems too magnanimous. That goal is too large to accomplish. In your own flesh, in your own strength, it is too much to handle in your own willingness. Because you know and I know that we're not going to always be willing to do what God is calling us to do. We're not always willing to put ourselves on the front line. We're not always willing to stand up and voice our positions. We're not always willing to be the object of somebody else's dislike. We're not always willing to put ourselves in what might be perceived as harm's way. That's why the Holy Spirit of God is so important. Why, preacher? Because the Holy Spirit gives you power. The Holy Spirit gives you power and a presence that enables you to obey what God is calling you to do. Let, 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 let me help you tonight. Because you might think that my shortcomings disqualify me. You, you might think that my limitations disqualify me. You, you might think that my inabilities disqualify me. You, you might think that my deficiencies disqualify me. Well, I have came to tell you tonight, and I hate to be the one to tell you, but your limitations don't disqualify you from the calling that God has put on your life. You want to write that down somewhere again. That your limitations, my limitations, don't disqualify me from what God has called me to do. That's why he's given you and I the Holy Spirit. 
because the Holy Spirit gives us the power to stand up when we feel inadequate. The Holy Spirit gives us the confidence to stand up when we feel like we don't have the strength. The Holy Spirit, his presence allows us to stand before the adversary and stand in conviction of what we believe. So your limitations are not going to cause you or allow you to get out of what God has called you to do. If that were the case, all of us would have an excuse to get out. But God did not choose, here it is, God did not choose the adequate. God did not choose the perfect. God did not choose the fully functional. God did not choose those who had it all together, but God chose those of us who are dysfunctional. God chose those of us who are a slight bit on the off side. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of us are two french fries short of a happy meal, but God still chose us. God chose those of us who did not have all the answers, who had more questions then we had answers. God chose those of us who did not have all of the right makeup. God chose us in our hostilities. God chose us in our insecurities. God chose us in our jealousies. God chose us in all of our frailties. But yet and still, none of those things are going to disqualify you from doing what God has assigned to your life. Jesus calls them and then he sends them on their way. Now you do understand that they were not fully ready yet to go. And there are going to be times in your life when you're not fully ready to do what God has called you to do. But if you can learn to rest on the power and rest on the presence of the Holy Spirit, you'll find yourself doing what you did not think you were able to do. He says, freely you have received. Freely you've received from me instructions. Freely you've received from me insight. Freely you've received from me words. Freely you've received from me encouragement. Freely you have received from me knowledge, information. Now, what you receive from me, he says, you go and give it away. See, that's, that's the challenge right there. Because he was calling them not to be, not to be swamps. You know what a swamp is, don't you? A swamp is that place where the water is motionless. A swamp is that place where algae and bacteria and all these nasty things gather. Nobody likes to be near swamps. And when you just get from God and hold on to what God has given you, you become a swamp. But I heard the Bible say that, that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Swamps don't produce life. But rivers, rivers produce life. R rivers, rivers are the conduits through which things flow to push out those toxins and those impurities. He says freely you have received. I've done something in your life that's changed your life. I've done something in your life that's given you a greater perspective of life. I've done something in your life that's caused you to have a greater degree of hope. Now what I've done for you, I need for you to go and do for somebody Hey, Lord. Somebody else. He says, I want you to go. But understand something, my beloved. Because what, you, what happens when you follow Jesus is that you have to come to a point in your life where you are fully and completely dependent on him. Jesus forces us to rely on him. Mm. That discipleship is not normal living. When, when, when you understand and when you embrace the mantle of discipleship, you're not being called to live a normal life. Look, look, look at what he says. He says, he says in verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there. Stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the house, give it your greetings. If the house is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. Go back up two more verses. Don't take, verse 9, don't take along with any gold or silver, copper or belt. Take no bag for the journey. 
Don't take an extra tunic. Don't take sandals or stand. Because I want you to rely on me. I'm, I'm going to force you. Hey, I'm going to force you to depend on me. Because discipleship is not normal living. Do you understand something? Can I help you tonight understand something? That the call to follow Jesus Christ, and you ought to write this down. The call to follow Jesus Christ is a call to inconvenience. There it is right there. Jesus disrupts your normal way of living. He disrupts how life for you has been constructed. And he tells you to tear down the house you built and let me help you build a brand new house. That, that, that right there, my brothers and sisters, is a challenging thought. Because when you understand the very nature of the call, when you understand the very fabric of the call, then you understand that this whole thing, there's nothing normal about my life as a disciple. There's nothing normal about being in relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing normal about being called of God to be a disciple. There's nothing normal about this thing that we call discipleship. Everything about it is counterintuitive. Everything about it is antithetical to the way we know how to live. And so it forces us to depend on Christ. But that's why you have to rely on the resources that you've been given. The resources that are available to you. There's nothing more tragic than for a person of faith, a person who claims that they're following Jesus, and you don't have enough willpower to rely on or to invest yourself in the resources that are available to you. That's like somebody who's hungry and going into a restaurant, a buffet full of food, and somebody tells you it's free. Eat all you can eat. And you sit there and you don't eat nothing. That's what it's like. That it's, it's, it's been presented for you. It's been given to you. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. It's there for your disposal. But yet, we don't take advantage of it. And that's why so many of us are crippled in our development. We're crippled in our calling. We are crippled in our purpose. But Jesus says, understand something. What I'm calling you and what I'm calling you to, you are not going to be able to do this without me. Because what I'm calling you to is another way of living. He gives them these instructions. He wants them to be uncomfortable. Can I bless your neighbor? I told you that the calling was one of inconvenience, but it's also a call to discomfort. God has come to make your life uncomfortable. Hey, glory to God. I know they won't tell you that in church. I know preachers won't tell you that because they want you to believe that all you have to do is sit there and God's going to do everything for you. Now, I, I hate to be the one to tell you tonight, but God has called you into relationship to make your life uncomfortable. That's what discipleship does. And the reason God makes it uncomfortable is because God wants for you and God wants for me to rely completely on who he is. Jesus is calling you and Jesus is calling me to do far more than what our own abilities will allow us to do. He's calling us, he's calling you, he's calling me to do far more than my limited resources are going to allow me to do. And that's why it's important, my brothers and sisters, to take advantage of the resources that God has already equipped you with. You have been, Paul says, you have been blessed over in Ephesians. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in high place. God has equipped you with everything you need 
You might not have a PhD, but you got G.O.D. You might not have an M.D., but you got G.O.D. You might not have a J.D., but you got G.O.D. You might not have a D at all, but when you got God, you got the Holy Spirit of God in you. And that, my beloved, that's enough to equip you to be not only obedient to what God has said, but it, the presence of the Holy Spirit has equipped you to now utilize and draw off of the other resources that God has provided for each and every one of us. Jesus gives them some real sharp and some real hard instruction. Don't take any money. Don't take any extra clothes. Don't take a tunic. Don't take sandals or a staff. Leave your gold, your silver, your copper. Leave it all where you have, where you found it, at home. Why? Why would he say that to them? Because it was about bringing them into a place of complete and total reliance on him. What about those instructions makes your journey <laughs> difficult? What is it about the instructions that Jesus gives them in Matthew 10, beginning at verse 9, down through verse 15? What is it about those instructions when you read it on your own and you ponder and pray about it? What is it about those things that make it difficult for you? Could it be the fact that He's telling me that I can't rely on what I have. Because you know we like to be in control. We, we like to have control, complete control over our environment, complete control over our circumstances, complete control over our input in something. But when you don't have control, you're forced to trust God. He says, this is what I want you to do. I, 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 I want you to go out and I want you to, to be my representative. Hallelujah. To be my agent in the world around you. To be my agent of change. To be my agent of influence. To be my agent of peace. To be my agent of love. I, I want you to represent me in the world around you. I want to ask you a question tonight. What, what is or what are your current goals as a disciple of Jesus? Do you have any goals that you want to accomplish? Do you have, is there anything about you and your relationship with God that you say, I want to accomplish this goal right here for God? If, what are your goals? Or are you just content with being saved and hopefully one day getting to heaven? And while you're sitting there waiting to get to heaven, you are missing a wonderful ride. It, it, it's like somebody goes to the amusement park and, and, and all they do is they go and they sit on the bench when they first walk in the gate. And they see all the rides around and they see all the people on the rides and see all the people having fun, some, some hysterical, some crying, some, some shook up, but they're all the people on the rides are having fun. And there's somebody on the bench who says, I didn't come to enjoy any of the rides. I didn't come to enjoy the benefits. I just came to sit on the bench and wait until it's time to leave. What's the point in even coming? What's the point in even <laughs> getting engaged? What's the point in being in relationship with God? What is the point in being in relationship with Jesus Christ? What is the point if you're not going to enjoy the ride? Go ahead and tap yourself and say, self, we're going to enjoy this ride. So if you're going to enjoy the ride, set yourself some goals. Set yourself one goal that I want to accomplish in this year. It could be my goal this year is I want to be able to just share the gospel with one person. My goal this year, I just might want to be able to read one chapter 
in the next two months. I don't know what it is. But have yourself a goal. Because if not, you are missing the ride of a lifetime. You only get this journey one time. You only get this shot one time. You only get this way one time. And Jesus wants to give you an experience of a lifetime. That's why we call this the experience Bible study. Because it is our belief that every time we connect with the Spirit of God, every time we come into the Spirit of God's presence, we believe it's an experience. It's something we're going to experience that we didn't experience before. And that's what discipleship is all about. I want to help a homeless person. I want to get involved in some advocacy program. I want to be there to help some young child. I, I want to be able to give my resources to help another life. I don't know what your goal might be, but find a goal. Don't waste the opportunity of a lifetime just because you are satisfied with what God has done for you. Do you realize that God has blessed you because God wants to and turn around and use you to be a blessing? And I know what you're saying. Preacher, you, all, all that sounds good. I hear you. It all sounds good. But you just don't know my story. I don't know your story. And all of us may have a thousand and five excuses as to why we can't do, why we won't do, a thousand excuses. But here's the question. When God is trying to get you to do something, what excuse do you use? What excuse do you muster when God is trying to get you to do something? What, what excuses do you give God when you really don't want to obey God? There it is right there. Wait, I'm too tired. They're not going to like what I got to say. They're not like me. I don't know them that well. What, what, what excuse are you going to use? Because you don't want to do what God is asking. You've already made up your mind you don't want to do it. So as opposed to saying I don't want to do it, you got to find an excuse as to why you... But what excuse are you going to muster? To God. I don't see anywhere in here where they gave Jesus any excuse. I don't see where they gave him any excuses as to why they could not do what they called him to do. He's saying, this is what I want you to do. Because, let me just be honest with you. He says, if you are ashamed of me before men, my Father, which is in heaven, will be ashamed of you. And there's nothing worse in this life than to have God reject you. Oh, Lord, help me get it. People, we can live with people rejecting us to a certain degree, but there's something different when God, you know the story, Saul was king. Saul was king, but, but Saul did not do what God told him to do. Saul decided he was going to hold on to some of the good stuff. And God said, I have rejected him as king. So I want to encourage you tonight, my brothers and sisters, but, but before you have to deal with the rejection of God, pause long enough and ask yourself, Am I doing this because of fear? Am I not doing this because I don't feel adequate? Or am I not doing it because I just don't want to do it? I don't want to obey God. And the Bible says, obedience is better than sacrifice. So as you ponder tonight, as you think about your call, as you think about what it means to be a disciple, as you think about where God has you in your life, as you think about the purpose in being a disciple, as you think about the nature of your own journey, as you think about who you are as a person of faith, 
and the calling that's on your life. The call to discomfort. The calling to inconvenience. The calling to be stressed. The calling to obedience. When you think about all those things, I want you to say to yourself, there's no place I'd rather be. The, my, one of my favorite movies growing up was The Wizard of Oz. I know you didn't like that movie. I know you, you probably didn't feel it, but The Wizard of Oz was my favorite movie growing up. You know the story, Dorothy. She's in this dream, this nightmare. She's in a faraway land, Oz. And towards the end of the movie, she has this line. She says, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Home is where you are with God. Hallelujah. Home is where you are in your relationship with God. That, that, that the journey may have ups and downs, highs and lows, peaks and valleys, good days and bad days. But there's no place like home. Home is where my heart is at peace. Home is where I can find rest. Home is where I'm sheltered from the troubles of life. Home is where I'm in that sweet spot with God. And what God wants you to do is to experience the journey of life saying to yourself, there's no place I'd rather be. Because if I'm with God in the journey of life, there's no better place to be. Bow your heads for a moment. Let's pray. Almighty God, we recognize our shortcomings and we recognize our failures. And we thank you tonight that you did not hold any of those things against us. God, we ask you now to empower us to now have greater clarity of our purpose and a greater degree of tenacity as we pursue our God-given call as disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. My brothers and my sisters, I am so grateful that you're with us, that you joined us tonight. And it is my sincere prayer that as you survey the landscape of your life and you really start evaluating what God has already invested in you, come to the place where you realize I'm already equipped to do what God has called me to do. And can I help you in closing? Nobody can do what God has called you to do outside of you. And if you don't do it, it won't get done. So as you go through the rest of Holy Week, as you go through the rest of this week, pondering over all that it means to be a disciple, yes, you will face a crucifixion from time to time. But understand that I'll also have a resurrection because he's equipped you to do what nobody else can do. So until next week, you be encouraged, you be blessed, and live out your call to the glory of our God. This has been Pastor Kenny. This has been the Experience Bible Study. Until next week, peace. We love you. Be encouraged. And we'll see you soon.